now. Well, it's great to be here, everyone. I appreciate uh, David having us in. Um, my name is Jerry Allison, and I am a CPA with Traders Accounting. Traders Accounting is a full service uh, firm, accounting and uh, tax firm for people that specializes in people who trade securities. Uh, that's what we do primarily. And so we are in your and one of the reasons that we're here is that we find uh, people, they get into trading, but they don't consider the tax consequences of them. That's a very bad situation to get into because we end up honestly having to clean up the mess afterwards. And it, it ends up costing money in, a whole long, whole, in the long run. And so what we are of this conference and, and presenting here is to get you to think ahead and start planning ahead for the tax consequences of trading. Uh, to kind of a, a very bad example, um, I talked to several people back in January of 2022. And uh, that may not sound, but if you remember back to November and December 21, there were a lot of people investing and going through the AMC and GameStop stuff. And you remember all that that hit the news and tons, lots of people made a ton of money there in 2020, 2021. The problem is they didn't plan, a lot of, a lot of them didn't plan for their taxes. And in the worst case scenarios, some people lost everything in Jerry but they still had to pay taxes on the stuff in 2021. So um, ever since then, I've been very uh, concerned about making sure traders get their tax patient in hand, that they know exactly what's going on uh, before uh, having a problem. Uh, so before we get going, there is a disclaimer here that I do want to go through. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the information, but in this presentation is accurate. Matter of fact, I went through and updated it yesterday. But tax changes do happen regularly. Um, the IRS has the power to change certain things on their own. So reporting requirements, uh, not necessarily tax rates, but uh, how things are done can change without Congress's approval. Uh, so just kind of make sure that before you use the information, you consult with a tax professional. This presentation does not establish a professional or confidential relationship uh, between myself and Traders Accounting and yourself. And then finally, Traders Accounting is not a law firm. This, none of this presented here is legal advice. Uh, now, a couple things here before we get going actually into the presentation. Um, and uh, I'm going to put a, uh, a, a link here. And I, I understand that that may be fading out here a little bit. And I apologize. I think maybe the interconnect connection is a little bit sluggish on my end. So uh, the link that I website and download a free ebook. Um, and uh, you can put in there if you want an appointment or not as well, but certainly download the free ebook and look at that. It's got a, a lot of the information and matter of fact, more than what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, today. So it's something that you can get, you don't use no obligation, and then you can certainly um, do yourself of that. Our phone number is 1-800-938-9513, and our email address is learn at tradersaccounting.com. And as I mentioned, that Traders Accounting uh, does traders, and so uh, we, would, we would love to hear from you. I'm going to put this information up towards the end of the uh, uh, the uh, the slideshow here as well, so that you can have that, but so you can uh, uh, and and write it down again. All right, let's look at some basic information here. Maybe if you want to call it a business one hundred and one session right now. If you're serious about trading. You really need to treat it like a business. Um, a lot of people get into trading and they think, well, it's just a matter of going out and, and getting, you know, having gains, you know, getting wins on, on, on the, uh, the uh, securities that are purchased and, and sold. And that's not quite everything there is. Um, 
because you really have to be concerned about multiple aspects of this thing. And the first one, you got to be concerned about your cash flow. Now, cash flow is just money coming in and money going out. Now, as you're learning about trading, and certainly this conference is, is a great session to learn about how to trade better. And, uh, and uh, it's the, the database error connections. So we keep trying that. Um, if, if you can't get into the ebook, but uh, cash flow is money coming in and going out. So make sure that uh, uh, you've got, you're, you're concerned about that because you're wanting to actually do trades to get money coming in. I mean, that's why you're here, but don't forget about the money going out. Uh, you've got trading expenses, certainly the commissions for the trades. Um, you may have data feeds. You've got seminars uh, that you're actually uh, uh, dealing with or subscribing to. You may have other expenses, and I'll be relating some of those expenses later on in the slideshow. Those have to get your attention too. And that's why I say you have to really consider it as a business and take it that seriously. You've got to consider the money coming in and how you're going to get those gains, but you've got to consider the money going out. And um, one story that I often tell is I've got a person of mine in Iowa and it's not he does he's not a trader but he's got a fantastic business he brings in several million dollars a year but he never makes a profit and while it sounds great having all that money coming in he's not paying attention to the expenses going out and it's leaking and and basically the business is leaking money and doesn't want to take the time to actually sit down and figure out so that's one thing that I'm advising you. That's why the business 101. Be concerned about your cash flow, money coming in as well as money going out. Because if you're not concerned about the stuff going out, then you may be hemorrhaged, but you still have to pay tax on the stuff coming in. So uh, it's very important. Uh, the second thing that I want to take note of here is that you should only make financial decisions about it based on your business needs, not on the tax code. This is a trap that a lot of people fall into. They, and, and traders do this too. They want to go out, they let taxes affect their trading. You can't do that because as we know, trading is all psychological. So you let taxes start interfering with how you're trading and you're not going to make any money. I've talked to several people who've told me that their trading is affected by taxes. Sometimes they don't even trade because they've made, quote, too much money. Uh, that's not a good idea. Uh, don't go out and buy things to write off just because you want the tax benefit. That never, almost never works out well for you. And so your decision, again, treat this like a business. Treat this like, what does my business need? Do I need a com new computer? Go out and get it. If you don't need the new computer, don't get it. Um, do you need, is this for itself? Uh, whatever you, that's the that's number one thing in business 101. If you get something for a business, it needs to be able to pay for itself in some way, shape, or form by saving you time or saving you money. So that's, that's my spiel about business 101. But if you start thinking like that, it's going to radically change how you do your trading. So, in this presentation, what I'm going to do here is try to make you aware of your tax and your protection options. And that's really what this is all about, to give you information. I don't expect you to take everything I say at face value. I want you to go read. I want you to learn about it. Now, there is a lot of false information out there, and I'll try to mention some of that as we go through. But the IRS has several publications. As a matter of fact, publication 550, 550. It's free from the IRS. You can download it. That deals with all types of investing. So I would suggest you get it. So what we're going to do in this presentation, first of all, we're going to talk about trader tax status. Now, every trader can utilize this. It doesn't matter whether you're a stock trader, an options trader, uh, Forex, cryptocurrency, uh, uh, futures and commodities. It doesn't matter. Every trader can utilize this. So that's the first thing we're going to talk to about in order to help save some money here. Then we're going to talk about entities. A lot of you've probably heard that setting up an entity 
exchange and save you some money in taxes. That is partially true, but it depends on the entity you use and how it's constructed and things like that. So we're going to go through and eliminate some faults. Is the number one thing that I have to go back and help clients correct because they don't do it right. So we'll specifically talk about that when we get there. And then the last thing we'll talk about is a mark to market election. This is a this is only for stock and options traders. Um, and in a nutshell, what it will do is you end up paying tax on what you actually earn. Now you don't have any deferred loss stuff sales and uh, the $3,000 loss limitation and things like that. So uh, we're going to get through all of this. So let's go ahead and start with trader tax status um, for all trade. Now, trader tax status is a tax choice. It is something you actually get to choose provided the criteria are met. And we'll talk about the criteria in a second. But what it allows you to do it allows you to deduct trading expenses on your tax return. So the stuff that I already mentioned, uh, those if you have advisory fees or if you you've this conference fee, um, if you have uh, data feeds, if you've got uh, subscriptions to things, whatever it is, if it's trading related, then we want to get it deducted on your tax return. Well, why is that so important? Well, you're, you're paying tax on the gains coming in. Why not get a fund on what you're sending out? And then that ref the, the, the tax that you're having to pay, or at least some of it. Um, but it's very important because, uh, you know, think about time value of money. You don't want to be paying tax out, getting any benefit from those expenses. So it's very important to make sure that you're you're talking or you're deducting those trading expenses if you're eligible. If you look at publication five, there are some criteria there. And those criteria are extremely general. Matter of fact, they're so vague that you can read them and say, what in the world do they mean by that? And I think sometimes the IRS writes stuff like that. So it gives their examiners or auditors, if you want to call it that, flexibility in interpreting things. Um, so what we have to do is we have to rely on some court cases. There are a handful of court cases out there for individuals um, defining what or when uh, people can have trader tax status. And number one, there must be 720 trades per year. There was a case, a uh, court case that went through and the 720 trades in a year allowed the individual to be classified as a full-time trader or as a have trader tax status. And they were able to deduct their expenses. The second one, uh, there's also, you have to be trading in over 75% of the trading days per year. So you can't take time off. Uh, you've got, it goes back to treating this like a business. Matter of fact, Publication 550 specifically talks about how you're going to rely on this as part of your income and, and treating this like a, a regular business. Um, if you were any other type of business, whether it was a restaurant or um, an automobile repair shop or whatever, you would not take off half a year uh, or you wouldn't take off two months at a time. Uh, you would stay with that business. Well, it, the IRS wants you to maintain that mindset. So they want you making at least 720 trades a year. They want you to be trading at least 75% of the trading days per year. That's about 188, 189 days out of the year, excuse me. There, you have to have over 500 hours in trading, research, and education. Now trading, okay, we understand that research, well, what's, what should I trade for? Which stocks or options should I, I, I work with here? But education is also included. Now, what is what? What do you have to do? Well, this this whole conference right here is did most of this thing. You've got several hours already this week uh, built into this thing. Uh, so it's it's very important that you spend that time. Now, a lot of people ask me, okay, well, these are the criteria, and yes, uh, the next question a lot of people ask, do I have to meet all three of those? Yeah, you need to. 
because uh, we don't know what happens if you go over, under rather, no, no court cases for those. So if you're willing to risk it and go to court and provide a case, uh, we'll be more than happy to read about it. But these are the criteria that we know. And if you meet all three of them, we can guarantee that you've got trade or tax status. and can deduct those expenses. Now, the first two, those are proven really by your statements from your broker. I mean, obviously, how many trades that there are. And by the way, a buy trade is one trade. The sell is another trade. If you have to buy something in lots, um, let's say it takes three lots to get a full trade completed, those are three separate trades as well. Uh, so it's not difficult to get the 720 trades in a year. But that's easily provable by looking at your broker statements. And then the 75% of the trading days, that can also be proven by your broker statements because all the dates are there. So you can just give it to an IRS examiner and say, hey, you figure it out. There are 88 days there. Let them worry about that. The last one is not so easy. And what we recommend is that you keep some type of a log. Um, the, keep track of what you're doing each day. It, it, can, it can be manual. You can do a little diary if you want. It could be in a spreadsheet if you want to do that, a database, whatever. Pick something. The idea here is not the format, but it's that you make the effort to actually be able to record what you're doing. Uh, it's almost it's very similar to like a mileage log book for a vehicle. If, if you've ever kept one of those. The IRS doesn't care about the format as long as you're keeping the information somewhere. And that's that's true here. Now, though important that you meet those if you want to deduct those expenses. And deducting expenses, as I said, can give you a refund to offset the tax you're paying on your gains. Um, and we want to make sure that happens. Now, the tax savings depends upon your current tax bracket. So if you're in the higher tax bracket, you're going to save more by deducting expenses. You know, so let's say you're in the 37% tax bracket, you're going to save 37 cents on the dollar by deducting these expenses. Um, whereas if you're in the 20% tax bracket, you're only going to save 20 cents on the dollar. So it does depend upon your tax bracket. Now, I do have a warning for you because this is a, a kind of Crap, but it's a problem for traders that you, you have to be aware of. A person deducting tradings on their personal return must use a Schedule C. And so if you're going to be a personal trader, I mean, you're going to trade just in your personal name, in order to deduct expenses, you have a Schedule C issue. And here's one of the issues that happen. First of all, your audit risk is increased. And this has nothing to do with trade or with per se. It has to do with the Schedule C. Uh, Schedule C is a small business uh, form that goes on your 1040. Uh, and it's used for really any small business, whatever it is. It's been in existence for decades. And people have tried to deduct all kinds of stuff on this thing. And it just becomes one of those things the IRS just perks their ears up a little bit. doesn't mean you're going to be audited, but it does increase your risk a little bit because every audit that I've ever been involved in, I've been in accounting for about 35 years. Every, well, I take that except for one that I can think of. The audit has been around a Schedule C. Uh, they're that, that heavily looked at. Number two, the home office deduction may not be attainable. And this is where a lot of false information happens out on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of peripheral things here. Um, but generally, if you read the home office deduction literature, there's a special form that you have to use if you are using a Schedule C. And that special form, I think it's an 8829, is for a home office deduction. If you read through that, if you do not have a profit, you can't take the home office deduction. And so you have to be making money and you've got to jump through other hoops there in order to get that home office deduction. So that can be a problem. So hang on to that one for a little bit because I do have a solution. Number three, 
there may be no asset protection. If you trade as an individual your own social security number, and if you were to get sued as an individual, for example, somebody gets hurt on your property or you get into a traffic accident, it's your fault, or something like that where you get sued personally and insurance doesn't cover it all, your trading assets are now at risk. And so that's, a, that's an issue that we really want to look at so that it gets protected. Or if you have a W-2 job and you're trying to be an active trader, the IRS has a problem with that for some reason. Now, like you, I've had multiple my time, years, of sometimes two or three jobs at one time. And we do that to survive, basically. For whatever reason, the IRS doesn't like having a W-2 job and being an active trader, just for whatever reason. So the way to actually solve this problem um, and not have the Schedule C issues from an entity. Now, so I'm going to talk about entities a little bit. We talked about trader tax status, where you can deduct expenses on your tax return. And that works out great. And you should if you're eligible, if you meet the criteria. Now we're going to talk about entities to cure some of those problems that we have trading as an individual. Now, there are several types of entities out there, and I, I list them there to show you how many there are. You don't even want to consider most of these, but sole proprietorship, which is basically just doing it on your personal tax return. Uh, single member LLC, general partnership, limited partnerships, multi-member LLCs, um, S corporations, LLC, S corporations, C corps, LLC, C corps, and there's some more after that, and we're not going to deal with them. We're going to put them down because, quite frankly, most of these don't work for traders at all. First of all, let's eliminate these two: the sole proprietorship, the one I just mentioned about filing as a a trader or as a business on your personal tax return. That's a sole proprietorship, and we already talked about the problems with that. A single member LLC pretty much is the same thing. Now you do get the asset protection so that uh, your LLC, you'd have to change over your trading accounts into business accounts, quite frankly. But once they're under the EIN of that LLC, then you've got some asset protection there. Um, that's the only thing it gives you because as a single member LLC, it puts it right back onto that of your personal tax return again. Oh, the only EIN now and some asset protection, but it doesn't solve anything tax-wise. So we generally don't recommend um, a single member LLC. Uh, there are cases where we do, but uh, we won't deal with it. The type of entity that's right for you depends upon your situation. So um, we generally recommend that we sit down and we talk to a client or first about what their needs are. As I mentioned, sometimes we recommend a single member LLC, but never to stay as a single member LLC. What, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but the beauties of LLCs, uh, whether it's single member or multi-members, is you can choose how you're going to be taxed. Um, so there are cases where when a person forms a single member LLC that we recommend that the they immediately uh, elect to be treated as an S corporation, not to leave it as a single member LLC, because you want to get it off your personal tax return, quite frankly. But that's not the one that we typically recommend. Um, but talking to somebody about this first before you do it actually helps a whole lot. Um, I have to. I do a lot of consulting uh, with traders accounting. And like I, like I said earlier, that part of the problem is going back and correcting things that, that people have already done uh, or getting them to go back and correct it. So um, before you do anything, just make sure you sit down and talk to somebody uh, before you do it and make sure you've got the right direction. Now, what we do typically recommend clients is a multi-member LLC. Basically, it's a partnership. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say about LLCs 
for the multiple member LLC is also true for the single member LLC. Your LLC is a partnership and it gets it off your personal tax return. Now, I am going to be very straightforward with everybody and want you to know everything that's going on. And certainly I want you to read stuff and, and double check on everything. But the cons of this thing, I'm going to mention those first. You do have a yearly uh, LLC fee. That's true with the single member as well as the multi-member in most states. There are a few states that once you get set up, you do not have a yearly fee anymore. Um, but most states, you do have to pay in some case $5, like in South Carolina. Um, California is 800 bucks a year. That's the highest in the country. But you do have a yearly fee in most states to pay. You will have a tax prep fee because this is a partner return. Um, but remember, I, I mentioned that the goal here is to get this off your personal return to reduce the IRS scrutiny. So it's very, you know, even though there's a tax prep fee, um, it may be worth it in the long run. And I'll talk about ways to mitigate some of that as well. And then also, when you set up business accounts, and this is true of a single member LLC as well as a multi, you have to create business broker accounts. And as you know, the, for whatever reason, the brokers think that, that businesses, regardless of what they are, are loaded with tons of money and must pay additional fees. Well, there's ways around that. Um, matter of fact, we've had brokers recommend this, is that you keep your personal accounts open and use some of the free stuff on the personal side while doing trading on the business side. That's how to mitigate that. So those are the cons of this thing. Now, it's your decision whether they eliminate or if they over, if those are less than the pros or, or more than the pros, but that's his option. So here's the pros. First of all, with a, an LLC, single member as well as multi member, you do get the asset protection. So if something happens to you personally and you get sued, it's not going to back up and they can't get to the trading assets. Um, there's other things going on there, but you do get that asset protection. Number two, and I mentioned this a little bit ago, you have a choice in taxation methods. When you first form an LLC, uh, you really get to choose how it's going to be taxed. Um, remember LLC, the default is a what's called a disregarded entity, but it's the Schedule C on your personal return. With a multi-member LLC, the default is a partnership tax return. You can also choose an S corporation, for those, or you can choose a C corporation. Um, now, we do not recommend corporation. Uh, the tax law has changed back in 2017, and it's not a really a good option anymore uh, for traders unless there are certain circumstances. And we'll get into those now with people who aren't citizens of the country in that. But um, partnerships and S corporations are usually the route that we go with. And there's a reason for not doing an S corporation right away. I'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, number three, a reduction in IRS scrutiny. Remember I said, if you're trading as an individual and you're putting those expenses on your schedule, see that raises the scrutiny. And then anytime the IRS, anytime the IRS sees a number on your return that they can't verify, it raises the scrutiny a little bit. For example, um, if those of you have W-2s or your, your spouse has a W-2, that's verified because that information is sent to the IRS. So your numbers match the IRS numbers. It's not a big deal. They're not going to audit you because of that. Uh, but if you put something on your tax return that they don't already have a copy of, like trading expenses or something like that, or home office deduction, things like that, then they have a chance to really come at you because they haven't seen that number. Now, what this does, if you file a partnership return, now a partner is a pass-through entity. All that income that's in the partnership still flows back through to the partner's tax return. But it does, the Schedule C, it goes through a Schedule E. But remember, you're sending that partnership return to the IRS first. So all those numbers become verified with the IRS on your personal return. So you might have on your personal return now have a W-2 that's been verified with the IRS or sent to the IRS already. 
you've got partnership income that's already been sent to the IRS. What do they have left off? They already know those numbers. So your personal return becomes much more audit proof. And uh, so you, you eliminate the IRS scrutiny on your personal return considerably. And we haven't had problems uh, really looking at S corps or our partnerships, particularly uh, when we do the bookkeeping, but I won't get into that. Number four, when you have a multi-member LLC, and this is true of a, for that fact, you can pick up that home office deduction. Uh, when you pick up that home office deduction, um, there are patients, like with the Schedule C, if you use the home office deduction, then you have to meet all kinds of criteria and jump through all kinds of hoops. But if you do it through the partnership, there are no hoops. You can just take the deduction. It doesn't matter if you make money or not. You can take that deduction. Now, that deduction is very important because for most people, that's at least $1,200 a year and usually more than that. Because what we're talking about is a percentage of your home mortgage interest, a percentage of your real estate taxes, a percentage of your insurance, um, utility, cell phone and internet, uh, HOA dues if you've got those, uh, maintenance of the house like lawn care or uh, snow removal or anything like that. It really goes into your apartment or your house uh, that we can take a percentage of that and write that off. Matter of fact, a percentage of rent, if you're renting, can be taken off. So that huge deduction. And so I mentioned I'd come back to it. I'm going to come back to it again here in a little bit uh, because that's a very important deduction. Uh, number five, when you get off and start a uh, corp return, it gets rid of that W-2 trading conflict that the IRS doesn't like. It looks like you are investing in a business and then you're getting, of course, the return from the business, but they don't question it, not anymore. And so it solves that problem. There's one other problem that it solves, and I've got some acronyms. It solves the mark-to-market, long-term, short-term dilemma. Okay, now what is that? We'll talk about this more a little bit. But in the mark-to-market election, which we'll talk about um, for stocks and options traders, that gives a truer uh, amount to pay tax on. And But you want to keep long-term securities away from it, because if you get long-term holdings underneath the mark-to-market election, then you lose the long-term capital gains benefit, which there's a, there's a cap on long-term capital gains of 20%. Can't go above that, and most people will get in the 15% bracket on long-term capital gains. So you don't want to lose that. So what this does by getting the short-term stuff into the partnership, we separate it from the long-term stuff, which is going to be held on your personal side. And that solves that dilemma. And then the last thing, and this may, you may not realize, the tax savings by doing all this can actually pay for the LLC. This is a multi-member LLC, a partnership. Um, but the tax savings can actually help pay for that. You say, how? How is that possible? Well, here. If you've already got yearly trading expenses and you're not deducting them, the refund you get from those trading expenses could pay for the yearly LLC fee and the tax prep fee. Okay, let me give you an example here. Assume a person lives in Alabama, okay? and it's typical of what we see, the yearly fee for the LLC is $125 a year, okay? And the tax prep fee is less than $100 a year. I think that's a little bit high for, and I, I don't know what our rates, quite frankly, are. I just, I just picked that number. Uh, I think it's a little bit high. But at any rate, let's suppose there's $925 of extra fees each year for this LLC. Now, let's also assume the person is in the 32% federal tax bracket and the 4% Alabama tax bracket. So that's a total of 36% that they're paying in taxes right now. Now, why am I bringing this up? Here's the calculation. I'll prove it to you in a minute. This person needs at least $1,645 expenses to get the government to pay for the LLC. 
In other words, if you have the $1,645 in extra expenses beyond the tax prep fee and the LLC fee, if you got $1,645 extra, the refund that you get will pay for the LLC. Now, remember I mentioned a little bit ago, keep in mind that home office deduction, that's at least $1,200 for most people and usually higher. Just by picking up the home office deduction, that will help pay for the LLC. And you might be able to pay for all of it. Let me show you. Let's look at a proof here. Now, our trader has $925 in LLC expenses and a tax rate of 36%. Now, if there's $1,645 in extra expenses, the refund will pay for the LLC. Here's the math. Your total deductible expenses, you take the $925 that you're paying for the tax return and for the LLC fee, plus the extra $1,650 that you've got in trading expenses, which could be just your home office. So there's a total of $2,570 in expenses. If you deduct those at a 36% tax rate, refund you get is $925. That's the tax prep fee and the LLC fee. The government just paid for your LLC by picking up these expenses that you don't normally don't have. So it, it can be totally worth it uh, in order to do that. So now let me kind of close this out here. Why do we recommend a multi-member LLC chip and not going to an S-Corp? Here's why. The S Corp, the when the S Corp, the officers are required to pay them a reasonable salary. Now, the IRS never defines reasonable, but most accounts will tell you 25 to 30 percent of your profit. So now you've got payroll that you've got to worry about. Uh, you've got to pay yourself a w salary, you've got W 2s and quarterly, uh, quarterly. Uh, 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 returns with the IRS as well as the state government. So you're going to need a payroll company to help you do that more than likely. So now you got an extra expense of a payroll company. So what we recommend, and you say, well, why would anybody want to do that? That's just an extra burden. Well, that is the only way to start a 401k, though, is with that salary. And so we recommend to our clients is start off as a partner. When you get your trading, Level off and you get a secure, you've got solid income coming in. At that point, we can make the election to be treated as an S corporation. We have a way that has to be done between January 1st and March 15th of any year. So that we move to the S corporation, you start paying yourself a salary, but then you can start setting up a 401k based on that salary because just on trading income, Trading income is not considered earned income and cannot be used for a 401k or any other retirement. So um, when you get your, your trading systems down and you've got solid income, that's when you want to become or have an S-corp. And then that'll take care of it. So just wanted to kind of as to why we're not going to S-corps right away. A multi-member LLC partnership is good. Now, uh, also at this point say, well, I don't have another partner. A lot of people, other partner. Well, let me go through this. Uh, if you're married, your spouse can be another partner. You can go 50, 50, 99 to one. It doesn't matter because it's all going to come together on your, your tax return. That takes care of a lot of people right there. You can have a family member, 1%. You get 99% of it. Your family member gets 1%. And then usually that doesn't mean a whole lot to their tax return. Um, but it does enable the partnership and gives you what you need. You can also form a family trust, an irrevocable trust where you can save up for a beneficiary. It could be your kids, could be a niece or nephew, somebody in your family. And 1% of that trust, and by the way, that's all on paper until something happens to you, um, but the trust would get 1%, you'd have still have 99% of it. If that doesn't work, there's other ways to do it. We can take information and create a multi-member LLC out of it. So 
don't feel like there's no way to do that. It can be done um, some way, shape, or form. All right, let's mark to market election. And this is something big for stocks and options trader, which I would imagine most of you probably are. Now, the mark to market election is an election with the IRS. It's not just something you do. Trader tax status that we talked about at the beginning, you can do that anytime. Matter of fact, if you want to, you can go back and amend your returns two years ago if you have expenses that you wanted to do. It's possible. It can be, that can be done anytime. This has to be done with as an election to the IRS. Now, any person or any business entity can make the election, right? The, the, the trader tax status qualifications are met. So um, if you, you want to make the mark to mark election for yourself, you can do that. If you want to make it for a partnership operation, you can do that as well. Now, Here's what the mark to market election does. It eliminates wash sale losses. You end up paying taxes on what you earn. Now, if you're brand new to trading, you may not be familiar with wash sales. What they are, they are basically deferred losses. So for example, let's suppose that I sell a security today and I lose money, maybe lose a hundred bucks. If I go back and buy anything with that ticker symbol, doesn't matter whether it's a stock or an option, if I go back and buy anything with, under that ticker symbol within 30 days, that $100 loss that I lost today moves to the second transaction. It just moved in time. So now it looks like I've, I broke even on the first one. And on the second transaction, I now have an increase in $100 in basis is really what it is. Well, for people who are trading very rapidly and over and over again every day, those losses can keep moving in time until they eventually cross for 31st. Once they cross over December 31st, the losses that move over are now in the next year. And so you basically end up paying taxes on stuff you lost money on. That's what a wash sale really is. It's a deferred loss. And I've seen cases where people have lost money in their account overall, but ended up paying taxes anyway because of the deferred losses. Marked market election eliminates that. What it does, it looks at the value of your account at the beginning of the year, your value of your account at the end of the year, it doesn't look at individual transactions, care less what the individual transaction was. It says value at the beginning, value at the end. If your account goes up, that's exactly what you pay tax on. If your account goes down, actually, you get to write that off because that's the second benefit here. Because under normal accounting rules, cash accounting, which most people are under, unless they make this election, you only get to deduct, if you have a net loss, an overall loss in your account, for the year, let's say you lost 20 overall for the year, you can only write off 3,000 of that on your tax return. And the remaining 17,000 carries forward to next year. Under market, you get to write off all $20,000 this year. Now, why is that important? Because you get the refund back this year and you can take that money and reinvest it. So it's very important back as soon as possible so you can invest it or do something else with it that you need. But getting that money back from the IRS now is very, very important. Now, this mark-to-mark -mark election, as I said, is an election. It has to be made with the IRS, uh, but it is a really truer picture of what's going on in your account, and you actually end up paying taxes on what you actually made, if you will. Now, this election must be made at the beginning of the year. If you're going to do it personally, you cannot do it for 2023 unless, with one exception right now, it's for those people in California and Arkansas who had their April 15th due date extended to October 15th. Those people could still make it. It has to do with fires and floods and stuff like that. But for most people, you can't do it now for pers personally. You'd have to wait till. Uh, between January 1st and April 15th of next year.
if you have a partnership or an S corp, you would have to do that between April or January 1st and March 15th of next year. So existing entities would have to do it at the beginning of the year. There's one exception. If you form a brand new entity, so like creating a multi-member LLC that we just talked about, created this month or next month, whatever, you can make that mark-to-market election immediately because that's a brand new entity. So if you're thinking about doing that, um, matter of fact, that's one area we could help you, Creators Accounting can help you with is set up that LLC and then we can make that mark-to-market election for you and get that done. And then you've got mark-to-market. So, but I would suggest talking to somebody first before you jump into this, because there are issues with capital loss carriers that you may not realize. So again, talk to somebody before you do any of this. So let's kind of summarize what we've got going here. And then, you know, I've got some last thoughts here. And then we'll go to the any questions and, of course, I'll turn it back over to David um, as we get done with that. But certainly put your, your questions in the chat um, if you've got those. Trader tax status allows you to deduct trading ex- if you qualify. Um, you've got to have 720 trades a year. You've got to be trading at least 75% of the trading days per year and spending at least 500 hours of trading research and education. So meet those qualifications, there's no problem with trader tax status and deducting those expenses. And by the way, I did not mention this earlier, you have to have trader tax status in order to elect mark to market. That's the link between the two. They are not the same thing, but you've got to have, you've got to meet the qualifications for trader tax status before making the mark to market election. Uh, Forming an LLC, particularly a multi-member LLC, provides your asset protection, it decreases your audit scrutiny. You pick up deductions that, that you normally could not pick up, like the home office deduction, and it could be free uh, because if you get those extra expenses deducted on the return, then the refund could pay for all the extra LLC expenses. Mark to market election allows stocks and options to pay tax on what was really earned. Um, or write off what was entirely lost. I've, I've written off, in some cases, over $200,000 for people in a year. Now, hopefully none of you experienced that because I don't want you to lose that much money, but it is a nice safety net to write that off. And by the way, some of you who are thinking ahead, if you have more loss than what you made, any remaining loss will carry forward to next year to be able to use, use up there. So um, that's definitely a benefit. All right, let me do the slide that I had a little bit ago. Um, the, the, uh, the link for the free ebook, uh, some of you were having some issues with that. I would suggest keep um, looking, try, we'll um, actually uh, contact uh, the, the people who have uh, the ebook and, or have set that up. And we'll, if there's a problem there, we will actually get that thing taken care of. Um, our phone number eight. Hey, Jerry. Yes, sir. Uh, I just heard back from Bryce, and yeah, there's there's some issue with um, the system. So yeah, ah. it's, just, it's just down. Okay. Uh, so, so Bryce is the one that's going to work on it anyway. So you've already notified him. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I appreciate that. So, um, I'll, our phone, I'll, I'll, post the, I'll post the phone and, and email again in the chat so people can copy and paste that. Okay. Fantastic. So I appreciate that very much. Phone number 800-938-9513. Uh, if you want to set up a consultation with us so we can talk about this thing, that would be great because that's what I spend a lot of tax returns as well. That's actually a primary function, but um, uh, you can set up a consultation and we can go through this and figure out what the right uh, entity is for you um, and how to set it up. And by the way, setting up entities uh, two to four weeks, that's the official uh, time period, but sometimes it takes uh, a lot shorter than that. And of course, you can email us as well, but we'd love to hear from you. All right, back through uh, some of the things here on the chat and answer your questions. And by, by all means, certainly put things in, in the chat there. Um, and so we're working on that. So keep trying it because Bryce is probably working on that right now. Um, 
I set up my own LLC for trading like a business. Yeah. And this where again, remember how you've got to think of this like a business, because if you don't, things can get out of hand. And as I mentioned, also the example I gave at the beginning about the AMC GameStop stuff, people didn't take that seriously. All they saw was the money coming in, but they didn't bother to think about the taxes. What my goal is to get you to think about taxes, have a system set up so you can't, you're not having to worry about it. So that is something that, that you know, is really my personal goal here as well. Um, good. I'm glad you know, that you're learning many things here. There's a learn here and I'm scratching the surface, quite frankly. So just, you know, don't you know, go out and do your own research um, and uh, certainly avail yourself of what's out there. I would try to stick as close to you can if doing your research to the IRS literature, particularly publication 550. Uh, because uh, we're finding, I, I'm, I'm see, talking with a lot of people and there's some false information out there. Uh, so just uh, be careful about that. Uh, for the multi-member LLC, can we use a Schedule C to report all the expenses? No, actually what would happen in the multi-member LLC, you would report those on the partnership tax return. Um, and so by reporting those on a partnership tax return, they're all contained in the partnership. And then the only thing going to your personal return is the stuff on the K-1, which is basically your expenses, summary of your expenses, your gains and your losses. And it goes through in a very clean way. So you don't have a Schedule C with a multi-member LLC. So that's why we recommend that. Um, <clears throat> under mark to mark deposits and withdrawals handle when calculating profits and losses. Oh, great question. And I usually mention that. The concept of mark to market is very simple. You take your beginning value and your ending value and look to see whether it, of the account and look to see whether it goes up. Now, that's the simplistic way of looking at it. But what we do is we have to go back and we have to uh, adjust for any contributions, any money you put into the account or any money you take out of the account. That has to be adjusted because you don't want to pay tax on stuff you put in. Uh, usually in the adjustment are interest, dividends, um, uh, extra fees that you might have, uh, sometimes futures. If you trade uh, options that are treated like futures, th that has to be an adjustment in there. But we do go through there and adjust all that as well. So there are some adjustments that do need to be made um, on the broker statements. Um, I appreciate the, the comments here that I, I'm glad I could help uh, inform you all because this is a very serious subject. Um, and uh, it's something that you want to pay attention to so that um, you're not get, getting caught, if you will, uh, that to uh, deal with a major problem uh, at, the, at you know, this tax time that you never thought you were going to have. And those are never, never pleasant to deal with. So uh, if nobody else has got any questions, I'm going to turn it back over to David and we will go from there.